Well, I had a, uh, <clears throat> a job during the summer of 1974 at Flint and Neal here in London. Uh, to get that job, I mailed out, mailed, not emailed at the time, some 50 resumes to firms across London. The economic times then were very, very bad, and Flint and Neal was the only firm to offer me a position. I enjoyed my work there over that summer. I was helping to check the Y River viaduct, and we designed some guide masts in India, as I recall. But on the last day of the summer, the last day of my job there, Mr. Neal and Dr. Flint took me to lunch at their very elegant, very British club. And we had a wonderful lunch, and towards the end, they, they asked me, why were you interested in applying for a job in London? Well, I told them the truth. I explained to them that as a young man, I had read Sherlock Holmes <laughs> stories, and I became entranced with London and Moors and the Baskervilles and all that. And I, you know, I, maybe I was a little too forward, but then I said, well, why did you hire me? And they looked at each other and they said, well, we read Huckleberry Finn when we were children. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, now, uh, well, so, so I've I already missed the first two slides. Um, <laughs> so in a sense, uh, my long relationship with structural engineering uh, and with the United Kingdom began with Sherlock Holmes. And I confess to this day, I go back and read him occasionally when I want to escape from the 21st century. Um, as I think back on my career uh, in preparation for this talk, I realize that Sherlock Holmes has given me more than just that summer job. In many ways, my career has been guided, for better or for worse, by how he conducted his consulting practice. His detective practice involved many of the same issues that we as engineers face in our work. His work required technical knowledge. He had clients of all sorts to deal with. Uh, he worked with intransigent public officials. He had to use his skills to investigate unknowns and reach logical conclusions and so on. To be fair, though, there are a few bits of wisdom that I got over those years that weren't from Sherlock Holmes as well. But I thought since the award, uh, for which I very sincerely thank the institution, uh, is for a long career, that it might be of interest to share with you some of these little bits of wisdom that I've picked up over the years. Um, now, and so Sherlock Holmes is sort of the basis of this talk. I, when I was preparing it, I was a little worried and thought that maybe basing it on Sherlock Holmes might be a little silly, right? But uh, I contacted one of my colleagues, Steve Burroughs in San Francisco, who won the Brunel Medal from the Institution of Civil Engineers a few years ago. And for some reason, he had to give his talk on life cycle costing, which doesn't sound like a very you know, lively subject. <laughs> But, but anyway, he based his talk on the story of the three little pigs, if you remember that. The, you know, the straw house, the wood house, the brick house, and all that. So I figured if he could base his talk on the three little pigs, I could do Sherlock. So, um, but the first uh, quote is, is not from Sherlock, it's from my father. He was an electrical engineer, and he was always tinkering with various projects, and often he would let me help him. After my projects didn't work, which was a frequent occurrence, he would tell me, it works the way you hooked it up, not the way you thought you hooked it up. It's kind of a simple little saying, but it's really the essence of what we do, in that we as structural engineers need to be able to understand the nature of things and predict how they're going to work. Um, too often we read about a hurricane or an earthquake that proved us wrong, or a, a building where an analysis didn't match reality and something bad, bad happened. We need to think critically about our work, questioning our assumptions to make sure that we have, in fact, considered all aspects of a situation. Now, my dad's saying is actually closely related to the idea behind a quote from a, some military general, whose name I forget, who said, if the map doesn't match the ground, then the map is wrong. <laughs> And again, you know, as engineers, <laughs> we need to keep this in mind. An another very wise fellow from my past is Fosler Kahn. Uh, he led the design of the Sears Tower and the Hancock Building <coughs> and other notable buildings from SOM in the 60s and 70s. <coughs> um, 
And he was quoted as saying, mathematics is supple and the friend of intuition. And I think what he was saying was that if we conceive a design that sort of intuitively looks right, then all the mathematics and design and so on that follows after that will work, it will be simple, and it will be elegant and show that the design concept works. Uh, now, he worked in the days uh, when engineers use slide rules, as I, as I did on my first day at SOM. I actually went out at lunch on the first day and bought a calculator. Uh, and it was important at that time to develop structural concepts that be, could be understood, analyzed, and designed using simple uh, processes. Today, when I see young engineers immediately jump into large 3D analyses of uh, very complex uh, geometries, complex buildings, I know the models are too complex for them to visualize what answers they should be get, getting or where the load should be flowing. And that's really not a very comfortable place to be. Uh, Sherlock Holmes also touches a little bit on the idea where he said, when he said, if you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, and yet you were quite sure of the fact. Um, again, sort of getting at the idea that intuition in an engineer, uh, you know, the sense of scale and proportion and an understanding of the load flow is very important to derive a, a structure that works and makes sense. <clears throat> Now this next quote, I, I don't know whether I heard it somewhere, frankly, or made it up myself, but I, but I have this theory that the great buildings of all time generally have some sort of underlying structural logic that, uh, well, as it says, to their form and their design that is apparent to laymen. Now, think, in your, in your own mind, think of the great buildings that, you know, ap appeal to you. I suspect the chances are that those buildings exhibit some sort of underlying logic, like I've described, that's apparent to your would be apparent to your mother, your neighbor, or a cab driver. Uh, sorry, I guess I'm playing with things here. Um, when I when I think of great buildings, I th uh, you know it occurred to me the Pantheon, the Eiffel Tower, the Hancock Building in Chicago, the Chrysler Building in New York. I think all of those have a very clear structural logic to them. And there are some great, some great buildings that, um, that seem fairly random. The Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao is one. But in fact, there's actually a very strong structural logic behind it. My, my partner at SOM, Hal Angar, did this building. But there's a very repetitive structural model, module that's repeated to create these forms. It's bent and twisted, but it's repeated. Um, so I, I think this falls into that same category. Um, and I, one other wise thing that Holmes said about, effectively about interpreting it in our words, eliminating failure, is how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now, um, <clears throat> You know, this, this statement is clearly attributable to forensic engineering where you're trying to find, uh, you know, a fault, a flaw. But it's also relevant to our normal everyday design processes. Uh, it's important for us to distinguish be between designing something that's new and unique or out of our experience range or beyond whatever the code was written for as opposed to something that falls neatly into a, a tried and true design practice. With a typical column or beam, like is shown here, an engineer can follow a well-trod path to an acceptable answer and be confident that that answer is going to work because the design process has eliminated all the possible ways that that uh, defined element can fail. <clears throat> but on the other hand, if there is something about the beam or the column that's just slightly different, but sufficiently different, that keeps it out of a standard process, then our challenge becomes eliminating all the possible ways that that can fail. And that's a much, much harder problem. Um, you know, history abounds with the examples, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, the Kemper Arena, 
the Box River bridges that collapsed, which led to my summer job, you know, at Flint and Neal. Um, Holmes touches on it again when he says, you, Mr. Watson, did not know where to look, and so you, you have missed all that was important. I can never bring you to realize the importance of sleeves, the suggestiveness of thumbnails, or the great issues that may hang from a bootlace. So, you know, he's basically saying that these little details make a difference. And if you think of the Hyatt Regency collapse, you know, that simple change of detail from one hanger to two hangers, again, if you look at it very quickly, they look kind of similar. But in fact, you know, the answers are different by a factor of two. So, again, it, when we're operating beyond a tried and true design problem, we really need to think about how we can eliminate all possible ways that that things can fail. And Holmes went on to say uh, about misdeeds, which to us is structural failures, there's a strong family resemblance about misdeeds. And if you have all the details of a thousand at your finger ends, <coughs> excuse me, it is odd if you can't unravel the thousand and first. Um, Basically, the uh, study of structural engineering is, is something that takes many, many years. Uh, it can't be completed in school. It's a lifetime process. It sort of reminds me a bit of your taxi cab uh, driver's training, the knowledge, except where structural engineers are concerned, our, our friends, the architects, the code writers, um, the researchers are shifting the streets all around continually, and so we need to uh, need to keep learning as as we get older. Uh, Holmes said, um, or Watson said, Holmes is a little too scientific for my tastes. It approaches to cold bloodedness. I could imagine his friend giving, I, I could imagine his giving a friend a little pinch of the latest vegetable alkaloid, not out of malevolence, you understand, but simply out of a spirit of inquiry in order to have an accurate idea of the effects. To do him justice, I think that he would take it himself with the same readiness. He appears to have a passion for definite and exact knowledge. This also has applications to us. There are, there are great divides in our engineering practice between our knowledge about individual pieces of things, a beam, a connection, a column, and entire assemblages of pieces. Um, we have a lot of knowledge and test data about the individual elements, but not so much about the entire ones. And if we're to really learn in the real world about those thousand misdeeds that we're trying to eliminate, we need to be implementing, implementing measurements of completed buildings to see if we indeed do know how to extrapolate from these individual pieces to completed buildings. Many years ago, I did some fairly unique uh, work on the Allied Bank Plaza in Houston. <coughs> it had a, we, we had a wind tunnel study done for the building. The, the model was only about this big, but we had, there were a lot of judgments that went into the study. What, what's the damping in the building? What's the mass? How does it, what are its dynamic properties? So we decided to monitor the building to measure accelerations. And while we were doing that, the Hurricane Alicia came right across Houston with highest wind speeds, I think of maybe 95 miles an hour for a three second gust. Um, and so we, we made some absolutely unique measurements at the top of the building, which is a whole nother story that I won't go into. But, um, but we measured about 45 millijoules, so four and a half percent of gravity accelerations at the top of the building, which was you know, probably an order of magnitude higher accelerations than had ever been measured in the building at that, at that point. And in the little uh, graph on the right here, I'm sorry about the quality of it, but the, the two lines represent a simulation that the wind tunnel did of the predicted response of the building. And then those little triangles there are the actual ones that we measured during the hurricane. So, you know, so this, this measurement of the building was really, I think, the first real proof that these little wind tunnel models actually work. So that's the kind of thing in the profession that we need. And I might add, we also did some very interesting work on uh, sort of the fast track erection of steel buildings. <laughs> that, uh, yes. 
That's another story. Uh, but there have been some tremendous achievements more recently using far more sophisticated equipment than we had 35 years ago, including the monitoring of several buildings in Chicago and the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Uh, although more of that, more of the real data from those studies really should be published. Uh, but this kind of real world information is very important to, uh, to practicing engineers. Holmes said, uh, I have no data yet. It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. Uh, his observation has direct application to uh, structural engineering, again, particularly for forensic engineering. Uh, on a personal level, many times while I'm working through a challenging problem, I find my thinking changing dramatically as previously unknown facts come to light. Uh, in developing theories, uh, Holmes in developing his theories, as in developing structural designs, it's important to let facts lead to conclusions and not the other way around. Our profession is profoundly different from others. Politicians can freely interpret facts to fit into their worldview but we engineers need to base our thoughts and actions on facts, reasoning, and logic. In the first draft of the presentation, I now had a slide of Donald Trump. <laughs> but but that, was, that was edited out. So, um, And on the same vein, another thing that Holmes said was, they say that genius is an infinite capacity for taking pains, he remarked with a smile. It's a very bad definition, but it does apply to detective work. Um, it is, it's sometimes, our work is sometimes hard and tedious, but it's very necessary to investigate and develop all the facts one needs to develop a correct theory of a crime or a successful design. So as we were saying earlier, the thoroughness is, uh, <clears throat> is important for us. <coughs> now, a few thoughts on collaboration. Look here, Watson, he said when the cloth was cleared. Just sit down in this chair and let me preach to you for a little. I don't know quite what to do, and I should value your advice. Light a cigar and let me expound. As a practicing engineer, I routinely wander up to colleagues' desks and ask for reality checks on things that I'm working on. Very often my colleagues, in some cases they're, they're young. Thank you. In some cases, they're young and others very experienced. Uh, they'll ask, uh, what about this? Or uh, what if that sort of question? That, again, completely turns my thinking around. And all of us have had different experiences in structural engineering and bring those different sensibilities to our designs. The more heads involved in a design, the more of those thousand misdeeds or thousand failure modes uh, will be considered in the final design. In fact, on that Allied Bank Plaza project, there was a fellow named Gene Miller who was a, a really tough, hard-thinking, critical-thinking engineer working for the steel fabricator. And after a hard day uh, of meetings with him, debating how to detail the connections in the steel building, he, he told me this. He said, <clears throat> I never worry about the details that we talk about. I worry about the ones we don't talk about. And, it, you know, basically, I think his point was simple. If we, if we don't debate one of these details, maybe um, something that one of us knows won't be reflected in the final design. Uh, and if we had debated it, we could have eliminated that, that potential failure. About the creative process... Uh, Watson said, I left Holmes seated in front of the smoldering fire, and long into the watches of the night, I heard the low, melancholy wailings of his violin and knew that he was still pondering over the strange problem which he had set himself to unravel. Now, maybe, maybe some of you, some engineers, can think up creative ideas in the middle of a busy meeting or while they're driving a car or in the shower. I, I can't. Um, my best ideas don't come easily. Most have come after many hours of scribbling on tracing paper late at night after Bobby went to bed. Uh, one uh, late night idea 
for the Russia Tower in Moscow, which we did with Foster and Partners, uh, became the signature detail of the architectural concept after some improvements by Michael Gentz and his, his colleagues at, uh, at Foster's. Uh, this, was, this was the sketch that I faxed. This, it, was, it wasn't that long ago, but we were still faxing, I guess, at the time. But you could see the building is sort of triangular in shape, and I suggested sloping columns to, to brace a central core. And, you know, being a normal sort of engineer, all these, all these bays were equal, and they all offset at the next floor. So I said, well, boy, that's very repetitive, should be easy to build, and so on and so forth. So I faxed this off, you know, at midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning. And in the morning, this sketch came back from, from Michael, <laughs> right? And so, you know, he said, well, Bob, well, that's a very interesting idea, but can you do this? And, uh, you know, where all the columns met at a point here. But he went, he went on further that, well, maybe the core doesn't need to come down to the ground. We, we, we were able to talk him out of the, the second. Uh, but at any rate, um, but this is the fun part of a project. He, he asked here uh, what size. Size can become an issue here. And so I did a detailed analysis that you can see right there <laughs> and wound up seven columns at two meters by two meters, right? Well, then we launched off into wind tunnel studies and, you know, huge analyses and nonlinear torsional buckling things. We really did. And after a year and a half, the columns wound up. There were seven columns. They were about two meters by two meters. So I, w I was really chuffed by this. But um, at any rate. Um, now, um, I haven't met Mr. Sider, but... Many, probably 20 years ago, I read something like this that he wrote. And I, I always thought it was uh, just a wonderful description of the creative design process. Uh, he says the design process, when it works well, is a series of logical decisions undertaken with talented colleagues, leading one to an unexpected but delightful conclusion. So basically he's saying, you know, when you start out on this process, you don't know where you're going to wind up but you, you take issues as they come up, you make a logical decision about each one, and you wind up somewhere unexpected. And uh, sometimes the design team winds up with a camel and not the thoroughbred horse you know, that they were sort of aiming for and have to start again, but sometimes the end result is new, unique, and sublime. Um, and in this uh, sort of creative process, the structural engineer has to be prepared to go beyond his or her sense of comfort, and propose new ideas that rely on his or her intuition. Uh, this was necessarily the case uh, on our central market project in Abu Dhabi, uh, again with Foster and Partners. We had about a week, or maybe it was two weeks, to, uh, in a charrette, a very short design period, to come up with the ideas for this. And we really, we, as, as engineers, we had no opportunity for any analysis or design or anything like that. So this was all from our judgment and our intuition. Uh, and those were some sketches that, you know, that I did at the time. These were some later analysis models that, that really utilized exactly the same uh, structure. And uh, again, after a year or two of hard work on the design, we were able to show in the end that the, you know, that the final design worked. And this was all based on intuition and judgment. Um, it, it, one th one th I thought very wise thing that I heard from one of my professors in school um, is that design is not really a matter of um, searching for freedom, although that's what designers think they're looking for, Really, it's a matter of searching for constraints. In other words, how far can I push the design in this direction before I bump into something? And, and what Holmes said was, <coughs> the most commonplace crime is often the most mysterious because it presents no new or special features from which deductions may be drawn. I have already explained to you that what is out of the, out of common, out of the common is usually a guide rather than a hindrance. So 
I, I believe design really is a search for constraints. Uh, and thinking back, the best, most interesting, and most elegant building designs that I've been involved with resulted not from having a clean slate or a loose pro building program, but from having uh, you know a site that was too small or a site that had trains running underneath it or you know a strange <laughs> mix of uses. And it was really those constraints that led, you know, that created a problem that had to be solved creatively. Um, you know, and the, I just use this as an example. I don't even know if this is on Earth or Mars or where it is, but can you imagine trying to design a building on that site? What do you do? Do you make it wide and low or tall and skinny? You know, there's, there's, no, there's no sort of um, impetus. At any rate, we... Uh, these, uh, these constraints can either be outside the design process, like I said, a small site or trains running below it or whatever, or it can be created as a part of the design process itself. In our uh, Troy Repsol project in Madrid, Foster said, well, we, we want to keep the plaza, you know, the ground floor of the building and the plaza open uh, and ha essentially have no columns other than the, you know, irreducible minimum of the, of the cores hitting the ground. And so we developed a scheme where the two cores in, in orange carried all the gravity loads of the building, all the lateral loads of the building, and the office space were, was a series of three bridges that spanned between those cores. So the, so the ground floor of the building was essentially column free. Uh, Recently, we worked with Morphosis, uh, an architectural firm in LA, on a, a project in Shenzhen. And here, the architects were involved long before we were. We were selected late in the process. And they had established a form that, you know, that tapered and sloped and cantilevered and so on. Uh, but it also had a very tough challenge in that they decided to locate all the core elements almost in a separate building here, uh, separate from the office space, and connect the two by a three meter wide bridge. And these uh, bridges at the different levels were gonna be in different locations so that the air could actually flow through these things. Now, I, just on a personal level, I think there's gonna be a lot of people going up those elevators, starting to walk out on a three meter wide bridge with glass on the sides, 300 meters up in the air, and they're going to retreat back into the <laughs> left lobby. But, you know, we'll, we'll see about that. But from a structural standpoint, um, it, you know, it was a big challenge. And what we did was wind up putting free-flying steel diaphragm bracing at every fourth level to hold, to hold the two halves of the floor together, each, each of which was too small to exist as a building in itself, and the deflections <laughs> certainly would have been too large to deal with, uh, you know, in terms of movements in the bridge. And then from a lateral load standpoint, we, we stitched the two sides of the building together by, a, you know, a multi-story sort of mega brace type thing. Um, now, we had to present these ideas to an expert review panel in China which is a collection of sort of 80-year-old Chinese engineers that, without much of a sense of humor about these <laughs> things, right? <laughs> and their first reaction was, ah, well, that's all very interesting, but why don't you put slabs across that gap at every floor, right? You know, and the architect's going, ah. But so anyway, if we did a lot of work and were able to convince them in the end that, you know, that it made sense. Um, but it's under construction now, and, and I think you know, it'll be a truly elegant and unique building when it's completed. <coughs> now, um, so these, you know, these sort of unique constraints that we put on our building are, uh, uh, are interesting. They, they create buildings, but they create, do also create a difficult situation for us uh, structural engineers. Many years ago, I heard a presentation by a fellow who was the head of the building, inf well, I guess airplane information modeling system. You know, their computer modeling system that had the plane in three dimensions and kept track of where the structure was, where the mechanical was, where the electrical was, and so on. And it was remarkable. Their uh, Boeing's design process for this 
I, I believe the design budget was in excess of a billion dollars. The design schedule was many years, six, eight, ten years. Uh, and then they, the designers, had access to testing facilities. So every single piece of the airplane was subject to a rigorous design process. The engineers could uh, fabricate a test piece, a test element, and test it. And if it failed, they could change their design, and they could keep doing that until it, it became right. Um, now, compare that to what we do, right? We, we get to design one often very unique building in a very short period of time, even fast-track schedule, with lots of design changes during the process. Uh, we're doing it certainly for a competitive fee, sometimes even a competitively bid fee. Uh, and we don't get, <coughs> and we have to get it right the first time. We don't, we don't have any do-overs, right? Uh, so based on all those issues, I think we're doing a, you know, a pretty darn good job, but it really opened my eyes to how different our engineering field is from, you know, from other engineering fields. Um, however, I, I think we should <coughs> keep in mind that I suspect the failure rate for a 747 is probably a lot, lot lower than on our, our projects. Um, that's something for maybe younger engineers about making their mark in the world. <coughs> there are no crimes and no criminals these days. There is no crime to detect or at most some bungling villainy with a motive so transparent that even a Scotland Yard official can see through it. And what is the use of having powers, doctor, when one has no field upon which to exert them? So, you know, unfortunately, to practice at a high level requires having clients who are interested in... Uh, developing projects, working with you, with unique designs, and also for being in a position of responsibility for those designs. These things don't happen by chance, but require many years of learning, developing trusted contacts, developing a group of satisfied clients, and working one's way into, into a position of trust and responsibility. <coughs> I might also add probably living at a time when there is not a recession going on. So. But these days, there's a worrying trend in the profession towards marketing and puffery and competition, reflected in another quote from Sherlock describing uh, inspectors Gregson and Lestrade, who he didn't have a lot of respect for. What you do in this world is of no consequence, returned my companion bitterly. The question is, what can you make people believe that you have done? Uh, so I suppose I'm... Uh, rightly considered an old guy now, but uh, in the new world of Twitter and Facebook and Fox News and, and these other things, this worries me. And again, I had another picture of Trump here. Um, now, and perhaps the biggest challenge that I think our profession is um, facing is, is brought up by this quote from Alan Shepard. The, you know, well, you, you've read it. But it's a very sobering feeling to be up in space and realize that one safety factor was determined by the lowest bidder on a government contract. Now, if you remember, he made this observation when he was, he was sort of in orbit, and there's some idea that maybe his heat shield had slipped and, you know, his capsule would burn up as he reentered the Earth's atmosphere. Um, now, when I graduated from college, the American Society of Civil Engineers Code of Ethics said that it was against the Code of Ethics for an engineer to submit a priced proposal in competition with another engineer. That was, that was 40, well, 41 years ago. These days, we're, we're getting pieces of paper, oops, we're getting pieces of paper like this on the right that say form of tender on the top. Form of tender. This, um, this is incredible to me. Um, well, let me find a place here. This is truly, in my opinion, an awful development for our profession and for society at large. 
Would you feel comfortable knowing that your doctor had the scheme to minimize the amount of time he spent planning or performing your surgery? And the idea that to be successful, we engineers need to think up ways to shortcut our design efforts, put less experienced personnel on projects to save fees, uh, try to think up ways to do less on a project, or jump to a standard solution without study of creative new alternatives is really a travesty. It really is. Uh, you know, again, when I, when I grew up and went through school, uh, I was inculcated with the idea that this is a profession, you know, that it's a noble profession. And I think this whole idea of bidding fees is, is just completely contrary to that. But given where we are today, I don't know how we can ever return to being a true profession instead of a commodity. But uh, obviously, I think we should all try. Now, personally, I feel much more comfortable with the unworldly approach of Holmes, as described by Watson in this quote. So unworldly was Holmes, or so capricious, that he frequently refused his help to the powerful and wealthy, where the problem made no appeal to his sympathies, while he would devote weeks of most intense application to the affair of some humble client whose case presented those strange and dramatic qualities which appealed to his imagination and challenged his ingenuity. And I think that's the spirit that you know, I would like to uh, practice engineering in. This, this is a charity that we have in Chicago called Canstruction where architects and engineers get together to pile up cans and you know, make models of various things. And this is of a sculpture that's out in a park in Chicago. And I think our office spent more time on this project <laughs> during about two weeks uh, than, than any other. But uh, now, so anyway, so those are you know, some little bits of wisdom that have sort of struck me as being important that I've picked up over these 40 years. But there is, there is one area in which I think Holmes did have it seriously wrong, as evidenced by these quotes. Uh, it's of the first importance, he said, not to allow your judgment to be biased by personal qualities. A client, to me, is a mere unit, a factor in the problem. Now, I, I confess I kind of agree with that sometimes. <laughs> but, but, um, but love is an emotional thing, and whatever is emotional is opposed to that true cold reason, which I place above all things. I should never marry myself, lest I bias my judgment. And lastly, detection is or ought to be an exact science and should be treated in the same cold and unemotional manner. You, Mr. Watson, have attempted to tinge it with romanticism, which produces much the same effect as if you worked a love story or an elopement into the fifth proposition of Euclid. So in my career, while all of these projects were fun and exciting, <clears throat> and it is greatly enjoyable to look back on them, my most enduring memories are of people, uh, clients, colleagues, and family with whom I worked and who helped me along this journey. These people and I shared aspirations for our projects, earnestness in our pursuits, humor in difficult times, joy in finding an elegant solution, and many other emotions. These are the things that stand out from the day-to-day -day work. <coughs> Without Dr. Flint and Mr. Neal, without Hal Iyengar, Stan Krista and John Zills from SOM, John Harris, an old client of mine, my current partners, Jim Swanson and Greg Lakota, uh, and my wife, Melanie, and my son, Bobby, uh, the last 40 years would not have the same meaning to me. So uh, I thank the institution again very sincerely for this wonderful award. <laughs>